All right, we're in uh, Hebrews chapter 9. We're ready for verse 23 through 28, but we kind of need a little context, so we'll start reading in a moment in verse 19. Let's begin with prayer. Thank you, Father, for this day that you've given us, and we, in our minds and hearts, we want to crown you as King of kings and Lord of lords, and we thank you that you arose from the grave, that you reign, that you're coming, even now reigning in our hearts by your grace. We thank you for this portion of your word. Uh, we thank you for the repetition that you give us, seemingly especially in the book of Hebrews, calling us to attention of the once and for all and all sufficient sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Open our minds and hearts, be our master teacher today, and we'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so this morning, February 13th, have you already got your cards, those of you who are married? <laughs> Not for yourself, for your wife. All right. When I was reading this passage, I kept going to a lot of different uh, translations, and I landed on the Amplified for these verses. Uh, sometimes Amplified just has a ton of amplification. This did not go overboard there, but it, was, it, was, it helped me in grasping what was being said. So follow along as we read this, and we'll trust the Lord to speak to us. For when every commandment in the law had been read by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of the calves and goats which had been sacrificed together with water and scarlet wool and with a bunch of hyssop, and he sprinkled both the scroll itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that seals and ratifies the agreement which God ordained and commanded me to deliver to you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the containers and sacred utensils of worship with the blood. In fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, neither release from sin and its guilt nor cancellation of the merited punishment. Therefore, see, that's why we had to read the first verses. So now we know what therefore means in verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary for the earthly copies of the heavenly things to be cleansed with these, but... The heavenly things themselves required a better sacrifice, required far better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the very presence of God on our behalf. Nor did he enter into the heavenly sanctuary to offer himself again and again, as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer over and over since the foundation of the world. But now, once for all, at the consummation of the ages, he has appeared and been publicly manifested to take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it was appointed, just as it is appointed and destined for all men to die once, and after this comes certain judgment. So Christ, having been offered once and once for all, to bear as a burden the sins of many will appear at the second time when he returns to earth, not to deal with sin, but to bring salvation to those who are eagerly and confidently waiting 
for him. I can't promise you that I'll answer it, but do you have any questions? <laughs> but there's a world of uh, wonderful foundational truth here, and let's dig in and see what we can learn. So let's remind ourselves uh, that the Hebrews who first are the, the people who most of them were Jews, maybe all of them, first got this epistle from the Holy Spirit through somebody. My Bible says Paul. Uh, <clears throat> but these people were being tempted to turn away from Christ back to their former Jewish religion. And I, I, I think it's important to say that their former Jewish religion was in reality a prostitute uh, of what the old covenant was. The old covenant was made by God, and it was good for what it was intended and for as long as it was, tended, was intended. No longer intended. But the Jewish leaders had already uh, added a lot of stuff to it, and it was, a, it was not a valid carrying out of what God has said, and especially now that is no longer in play. So if they had been following the old covenant as set forth in the Bible, they would have already put off their garb and put a sign out where they did all the killing of the sheep, said closed, <laughs> no longer in use, no longer needed, P.S., go see Jesus, <laughs> go see the epistles. Uh, uh, one of our former lead guys, Saul of Tarsus, is now Paul the Apostle, check with him. <laughs> so, or they might have said, remember John? He saw it. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was as uh, steeped in all of the old covenant uh, theology as they, but without its, um, all of the additions that they added. When we add things to what God has set forth, there is a tendency to love what we've added more than what God has said. And that's still a danger. So, the reality is, if our trust is in Jesus alone for salvation, then we escape God's judgment. But if our trust is in anything or anyone else, judgment is coming. And that's a great message of, the, of this portion of Scripture. Uh, is, is this really a question for today? A concern for today, uh, a valid concern that, that people in their pride and trusting something that someone else has said, uh, w would we follow in the steps, as it were, of these uh, ancient Jews who were trying to persuade others to go back to, to Judaism? Well, Jesus said in Matthew uh, 7, 21 through 23, that there are many who have fallen into this trap. And I've told many of you before, I'm, I'm not a fan of, para, uh, of uh, allegories. Uh, I'd rather just read and not have to go through all the allegory and the signs and whatever. But, um, of course, a famous good one is Pilgrim's Progress. This is a not-so-famous little one. <laughs> I picked it up in 1980, and I began to pass it around to any and everybody. I don't think you can find it there. It's called Escape from Christendom. The author is listed as Robert Burnell. Uh, that's a name that he, was, he used for this book. That's not his actual name. I have actually talked with this guy. He's about 88 years old, still serving the Lord. And uh, toward the end... Uh, this little book, and this has been put in newsletters and sermons on a number of occasions. But he said, never has it been more clear to me that two revivals are in progress on the earth. 
One is the revival of the Spirit of God, by which dead men and women are freed from their sins by the blood of the Lamb, and raised to life, which is the life of the sons of God, a life which bears God's nature and manifests God's mercy. The other revival is a revival of religious flesh, a revival which is so appealing and gathers such multitudes and wields such power in this world because it offers all the comforts of religion while at the same time allowing you to keep your ego and your rights to yourself. Now that's a very attractive religion. You can have heaven, you can have Jesus, and have your sin too. And that is a popular religion. And so we need to guard our hearts. So it's, it's valid for us to look at what these early Christians were facing and their temptation to go back to something other than what was revealed. Uh, we face all kinds of temptations seeking to pull us away from a pure, simple, profound uh, faith in the doing, the dying, the rising of Jesus Christ. So again, if we hold to some religious system, some good works of righteousness, some religious heritage, some famous Bible teacher, and we elevate that or them, we're, we're on dangerous ground. And people are being left without hope and without God because of that. In verse 27 and 28, there are two options for the future, judgment or salvation. Because of Christ's once and for all sacrifice for sin, being in Christ, we not only have our sins forgiven, but we're looking forward to his return, not with fear of judgment, but with expectation of salvation. You say, well, how could I be expecting salvation? I thought I was saved. Well, there are tenses in salvation. Saved, being saved, shall be saved. Uh, looking forward to glorification. Uh, looking forward, we, we now have the down payment as it has been referred to. We're looking forward to the fullness of all that God has for us. In verse 23 through 26, again, they emphasize over and again and it starts there with, therefore, goes back to this previous session or section which made the point that forgiveness of sin is only through the shed blood of sacrifice. And all of those uh, sacrifices in the Old Testament were pointing to the sacrifice of the Son of God. In verse 24, it states that Christ has entered into the true holy place in heaven to appear in the presence of God what? For us. Two most powerful words. What an amazing thing that he has appeared in the holy place in heaven for us. Now we know from Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6 and other places that even now we are his dwelling place. We are his temple. And, and yet and gloriously, we look forward to seeing him face to face. And so the answer is that Christ's blood alone cleanses our conscience from dead works, pays our sin debt, and... In verse 24 through 26, the Holy Spirit further explains this better sacrifice. And again, these, these early Christians were having a hard time leaving the physicality of it all. There, there are these incredible rituals and routines. And if you'll just look around the globe... Uh, so often, religion revolves around sacred rituals and routines, and whether in the name of Christ or whether in the name of some other uh, man-made religion, there will be priests and our high priests, and they're the ones who can get close, 
or they're the ones who can ward off the demons. And so they have all of these rituals and routines, and the hope is put in doing that. It was an amazing sight to uh, be walking down the streets in India and see uh, people throwing flowers, throwing different things at, at gods, or more, more astounding to me was at the cathedral in Santiago, Spain, a cathedral in the name of Christ, and you go in this magnificent edifice that was built on 13 or 1400s, and you walk in, and there at the front of what I'll just call the auditorium or the sanctuary was this incredible huge idol that you could actually walk up in, an idol of Jesus Christ. And they had idols all over the place, and because this thing was, has been in existence since the 1300s, there are many places where, where these huge concrete columns and various things have deep indentions where over hundreds and hundreds of years people have come and hugged them and held on to them. And the darkness was incredible. And the worship was sincere. And they were going through rituals and routines, and their hope was that the priest could take them where they couldn't go. I remember reading where uh, the famous Catholic nurse, Mother Teresa, uh, she talked about how that she loved for the priest to come because they were the ones who could connect them to Jesus, and that without the priest they would be lost. Uh, they couldn't get to Jesus except through the priest. So, again, my point originally in this little diatribe was, was that uh, the, the people who first got this had all their lives built their religion and their worship of God around a set of rituals and routines and, and people who were on a higher plane than they were we're going to help them to get to God. And so now, the new covenant comes along, the gospel is preached, and all the Old Testament is fulfilled, and we no longer have priests, except we are believer priests, and we go directly to God through Jesus Christ. And he is our high priest, and we have no other priest. And so... Uh, as a pastor teacher or as elders, elders, pastors, bishops, interchangeable words, uh, we're not on a high, higher plane than anybody else. We also are sheep. And that's our primary, primary identity. We are all sheep. Now we have different callings and positions and places in the body of Christ, but we're all bond or free, male or female, whatever, equal footing at the foot of the cross. And we have the one high priest. So as we move along here and talking about the better sacrifice, the emphasis is made and so excitingly so that the, in the old covenant, the priest had to keep coming back every year, sacrificing again. Jesus once and for all offered his own blood, not the blood of an animal or of another human being, uh, and he didn't have to do it over and over, but once, once and for all. And so, in verse 26, that at the end of the age to put away our sin, the consummation of the age. And emphasized earlier in chapter 8 and also in chapter 9, verse 11, that Christ did not enter into a holy place made with hands a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Verse 24 is what that is. This is an incredible statement. This is incredible good news. Christ did not enter into a holy place made with hands. Yes, Jesus came to earth. And yes, he died on a cross. Uh, but the ultimate sacrifice is being made and his ultimate journey is to go back to heaven back where in a unique sense even though God is omnipresent 
he is uniquely in a place in heaven where his throne is, where he is in a unique sense. And Jesus Christ came back to heaven from whence he had come. Uh, a place that's not been made with hands. Verse 24 again. Not a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God. So again, the high priest in the old covenant would go back year after year. But Jesus went to the holy place in heaven permanently on our behalf. So why is he doing this? Because justice has to be carried out. Uh, Jesus couldn't, God couldn't just forgive our sins. And this is a point that really hinders a lot of people. Why should God be angry with us? Why should, why should sins have to be paid for? Uh, isn't, isn't this making Jesus uh, just uh, uh, cosmic child abuse is what it's referred to by some people. Well, if you accept the authority and the teaching of the Word of God, God is holy, 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 and He has decreed from the get-go that the wages of sin is death. And God does not just close His eyes and say, it's okay. I, I, I know that you sin, but it's okay. It's not okay. We've sinned against holy God, and we deserve death, and we are under the sentence of death. And the only way for that sentence to be lifted, lifted is that God so loved the world, he gave his son. So the death of the infinite holy son of God satisfied, propitiated God's wrath by paying the penalty we, that we deserved. One person has said any system of salvation that magnifies human merit or minimizes the cross is not of God. And, and if I'm just wanting a little bit of credit, <laughs> uh, God's salvation is not a joint venture. God is not um, carrying out the new covenant with 99.9999% him doing and one thousandth of one percent of our doing. At the cross, verse 26, Christ put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There is a cancellation in totality, in every degree, in every age, going back all the way to the beginning, going all the way to the end, one sacrifice for all those whom God in his electing love saves from, from Adam to when Jesus comes back. He died once, and he didn't just leave. He didn't come to earth and die once and say, okay, I've died now. It's up to you all. It's what you do with it. If it's meant to be a pastor's office, I walked in his office, he said, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. Uh, Matthew 1 21 Jesus Christ came to save his people from his sin uh, and John 10 11 14 and 15 he came to lay down his life for his sheep Ephesians 5 5, 5 25 Jesus Christ loved the church and gave up himself for her in 928 of Hebrews, he offered, he was offered once to bear the sins of many. Uh, in John 6, 37 through 40, uh, Jesus is not going to fail in his purpose to save all the ones whom the Father has given him. And that's a, you know, that's a concept that for many years was foreign as a fruitcake to me. I would read that and just keep going. I'd read the, the high priestly prayer and, and, and just like water on a duck's back. And missed the main point for so many years. 
that all that the Father has given the Son will be saved. Now, we could, we could say, well, how can I know for sure that Christ offered himself for my sins? And that's a good, important question. Well, let me ask you a question, and let me ask myself a question. Are you aware of your need for cleansing from your sin? If you have that Holy Spirit revelation, Jesus did not come to save the righteous. And this is where a lot of people are. Well, I'm not a bad person. Well, I'm, as, I'm every bit as good as those hypocrites down at church. We have all these things that we say that reveal that we've never been convicted. I'm a sinner without hope and without God. And, and, and so, and I often, in sharing the gospel with someone, I'll, I'm pressing this point. Are you, are you convicted that you are a sinner? And if so, that's good news. Because <laughs> those are the kind of people that Jesus saves. He did not come to put away uh, or to give eternity or to give heaven to those who think they're righteous. Uh, related to that, am I fully aware that there's nothing I can do to pay for my sin? You could be so, well, I, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. And so because of that, I've been doing this and this and this. I cannot put away my sin through personal determination through self-denial, through good, doing good deeds, I cannot pay for my sin. Even the Old Testament uh, sacrifice system, chapter 10, verse 4, did not put away sin. Only Christ, by his death on the cross, can do that. So, if you are trusting in Jesus Christ and in him alone, then you can be assured that he has put away your sin. Spurgeon put it this way. If any are conscious of the burden of their guilt and the impending judgment of God on their sins, the news of one who can put away sin should be of great joy. The news of Christ coming into the world to put away sin will sound like a trumpet blast of joy to those who know themselves to be full of sin, who desire to have it put away, who are conscious that they cannot remove it themselves, and are alarmed at the fate which awaits them if their sin is not by some means blotted out. So, um, part of the good news here in these verses, uh, verse 27 and 28, is that when Christ comes again, we look forward to salvation and not judgment. Uh, he's coming to judge the world. But in Christ, we're looking forward to salvation. He died once, but he will appear a second time, not for judgment, but for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await for him. So there's several things that we can emphasize here. First of all, we all have an appointment. You may or may not have an appointment book. You may just keep it all in your head. You can have an appointment book and still miss your appointments. But you will not, and I will not miss, I have an appointment, I'm going to keep. I don't know when it is, but I'm going to keep it. You say, well, we could be here when the rapture takes place. So be it. But there is appointed to men once to die, then the judgment, because man has sinned, and God has ordained the penalty for sin as death. How many times have you been at a funeral home, and maybe you've done it yourself to some degree, uh, you're trying to comfort someone in their hour of death, and we, we say, well, you know, or maybe look in the cask, oh, they look so natural. They look so good. They look dead. Now, a grant, this is not something you say, when you're holding uh, a weeping one and they are missing their loved one. But the reality is we give a lot of false comfort to people in the hour of death. And sadly, a lot of preachers stand 
behind pulpits and give a lot of false comfort. Uh, I don't recommend you do this to your book, Tower to Page. <laughs> Uh, it actually fell apart. I've used it so much, and so I just, I didn't want to bring the whole book, so. This is from uh, When Your Rope Breaks. I've mentioned it many times. It's a great book. Uh, but so, talking about implications of the fall. One I don't want you to miss, the reality of death. Romans 12, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man centered into the sin entered into the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 53 that the sting of death is sin in other words the ultimate result of sin is death have you ever had someone tell you not to worry about death because it was as natural as birth is a part of life. They lied to you. It is not as natural as birth and just a part of life. It is not natural. We were not born to die. Death and disease are a result of sin. And he goes on to tell about flying from <clears throat> Miami to uh, Los Angeles <clears throat> and uh, while on this flight someone died there on the plane and a lot of people on that flight <clears throat> excuse me had just come from a cruise you know, having big time on a cruise and so here this is a downer you just had a week cruise out on the ocean and seen all these sights and entertainment and all this stuff and you get on the plane you're going home and you're having good remembrances and the person sitting next to you dies so this guy a pastor spoke to a, a stewardess and said uh, I informed the flight attendant that I was a pastor and if I could help, I'd be glad to do anything I could. Here's what the lady said. I appreciate your offer, she said. But we have decided to give all the passengers free drinks. This ought to make them feel better. Many years ago, my father-in-law and mother-in-law lived in a high-rise senior citizen place in Nashville. And through them, I had the opportunity to go down and, and have a devotion. And so this little bebopping activities girl who was in charge of all of that uh, came up and uh, she said, glad to have you. Now, I, I want you to understand that all the people who live here are elderly. Please do not speak to them about death. So I said, uh, can I share the 23rd Psalm? Oh, yes, that'd be wonderful. Do you realize the door that I had just opened? <laughs> she didn't get it. But I, without being rebellious toward her prohibition, Thou art with me through the valley of the shadow of death. Hallelujah, what a Savior. The sting of death is now gone because Christ paid the sin debt and he is risen from the dead. God's holy justice has been met. But apart from, apart from Christ, people die and face judgment. Um, a pastor named Philip Hughes wrote, To refuse the cross as the instrument of salvation is to choose it as the instrument of judgment. Um,
I made mention earlier that there are the tenses, uh, we're saved, justification, being saved, sanctification, will be saved, glorification. And, uh, but I wanted to end with uh, an account that uh, I read about. I've not been able to trace the actual history of this, but may well have happened. Years ago in a frontier town, a horse bolted and ran away with a wagon that had a little child on it. A young man risked his life to save, to catch the horse, to stop it, and to rescue the child. Sadly, the rescued child grew up to become a lawless man. One day, he stood before a judge to be sentenced for a serious crime. The prisoner recognized the judge as the same man who years before had saved his life. So he began to plead for mercy. I'm the guy that you saved way back there. Well, all the words were received in silence, and then the judge spoke. Young man, then I was your savior. But today, I am your judge, and I must sentence you to be hanged. And the gavel went down. And this, again, is a part of the profoundness of this passage of Scripture. The, the coming of Christ, the result of what he did at Calvary, the glory of his resurrection, all means salvation, eternal salvation for those who are trusting Christ and Christ alone. But if you leave this earth trusting yourself, trusting religion, trusting anything or whatever other than Jesus Christ, his blood and righteousness, you will one day face him as judge. And that will not be good. One of the most awesome passages in all of the Bible is in the book of Revelation, where it talks about the wrath of God being poured out in the presence of the Lamb. So it is a humbling thing, even as simultaneously is, it is a glorious thing. And what a blessed reality to live in the day of salvation, that we can rejoice in salvation and we can go to the people in our world and speak the gospel to Christ, of Christ to them and say, today is the day of salvation. Flee to Christ before it is eternally too late. Our Father, we bless you and praise you for the wonder and the, awe, the awesomeness of the truths that are set forth we thank you that by the Word of God, by the ministry of the Spirit of God, that many, hopefully all in this room, came to that place of owning sin, seeing Christ, fleeing to Him. Lord, we thank you that by your grace we also look forward to your coming. For the best is yet to be. We've but the down payment. As good as it is, it's not nearly what it shall be when we shall see him, when we shall see you, Lord, face to face, and be as you are, and rule and reign with you for all eternity. We thank you, Father, that in the midst of a world that is darkening and is filling our hearts with all kinds of fears, that we can, because of meditating upon scriptures like this, we can get ourselves in position and know that all is well with my soul in Christ. And I can be caught up, not with the affairs of this life with fear and trembling, but be caught up with the opportunity to manifest joy in Christ and hope in Christ and the power of the gospel. And we bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.